Hi, welcome back. This is the uh, next installment for the power supply project. Sorry it's uh, taken so long in coming. Been rather busy over the Christmas period with a challenge that I decided to undertake with Element 14. So that's all over and done with now and I'm getting back to the uh, regular installments for the power supply and other projects that I'm doing. So um, this episode is going to be dealing with the power input stages of the power supply project. So taking your mains input, converting it into a DC high power supply uh, suitable for feeding into your regulator stage and of course out to your projects. So we're going to look at a few different things here. Now a word of caution right up front. Uh, some of the things I'm doing here um, it does involve mains wiring and things like that. Now I've prepared a demonstration board up front and made it as safe as I can for the sake of the demonstration so we sh you know I'm I know what I'm doing so I'm going to be fine but definitely a word of caution if you're not comfortable or know what you're doing with mains have somebody help you that knows what they're doing and potentially qualified to do it either that or um, later in this episode I'm going to show you some alternatives for the supply that you could look at doing so uh, anyway without further ado let's get into it so let's start with the part nearest the mains and for the sake of safety, we'll start off with the version that does not involve you having to um, start dealing with transformers and wiring up uh, mains connectors and things like that. So what I would suggest for things like this is look out for an old uh, laptop power adapter. For instance, this big huge brick here is from an old Dell laptop. And according to the specifications on the back, it actually would give out 19.5 volts at up to 11 amps. So whilst it won't be able to give you a 30 volt power supply, you can certainly use it to power, um, you know, 15 volts or towards 18 volts. Remember, you're going to lose a little bit in the in the system, and up to 10 amps quite easily. And and the nice thing about this is it has a standard um, mains connector for the regular cables you get in, with PCs and things like that and whilst it has usually these rather large uh, connectors on the end for plugging into the back of the laptop you can always cut that off and wire it directly into your power supply or get the equivalent um, mating part to that and use it as the input on the back of your uh, unit so if you can you know assuming you're going to eventually put it into a case or something. Either way you ch you do it, uh, the thing about this is that you do not need to get near the mains, all right? You're just gonna be plugging your wall socket straight into the, into the end of here. Uh, it'll take 110, 220 volts, 50, 60 hertz, doesn't matter. And it's gonna give you out a nice uh, 20 volts or almost 20 volts output at uh, 11 amps. So, you know, as I said, 15, uh, plus 15 volt power supply at 10 amps, that's going to be quite a handy power supply. Now, you may not have something this big or even need anything of that power, so you can also, you know, laptops come in all sorts. This is from a much, much smaller um, laptop power wise, um, but this one still gives out, according to this, uh, one and a half amps, sorry, wrong side, uh, 20 volts at 3.3 amps. So that would still be good, even though it's a lot smaller, to drive a power supply for most projects because mostly you don't need to go above about 15 volts. Um, it'll let you do your power supply uh, 15 volts, you know, 3 amps and things. That's still quite a good power supply. And again, you don't get anywhere near uh, mains voltages and things like that as far as the construction you're doing and things like that. So it's very safe and very easy to do. And the only thing that that kind of adapter would limit you to is obviously your maximum voltage. And because they are switch mode power supplies, uh, they work at high frequency. There may be a little bit of noise on the line, but mostly with uh, a few smoothing capacitors and maybe putting a choke in the line, you can eliminate all of that. And to be honest, for most um, projects you would ever build, it wouldn't have any uh, negligible impact because if you think about it, you know, even a full PC with everything else that goes on in it, um, these things are still perfectly good for that. So unless you're doing very high end instrumentation and very sensitive electronics, very, very small signals, it won't matter. Um, so that's a good option for those of you that don't want to get into 
working with transformers and building your own um, power stage for the input of the power supply. So that's it for that. Now let's go look at some other options. I think the first thing you probably want to think about when you're building your power supply is actually what do you want out of it? Uh, do you want a plus and minus 12 volt power supply? Do you just want just plus 12 volts? Do you want plus 30 volts? Um, how much current do you want to be able to have coming out of it? One amp, three amps, five amps. Most of the uh, lower cost ones you can buy from eBay and things, they're typically uh, plus one amp to about plus three amps and they'll go up to about 30 volts. And it's all about really what power stage you pick for your power supply. So what I have here is a selection of toroidal transformers that I'm going to show you. And they start off with small ones. Um, this is a relatively small toroidal transformer. It comes with a, you know, it's um, got a solid center in here. So you're not, the way you would mount this is you would put a bolt through the center of the transformer and mount it into some kind of chassis. But the weight of this thing, it's still probably, you know, over half a pound in weight. So you have to consider that whatever you're going to put it onto, if you um, jar or knock that um, piece of equipment once it's all finished, there's going to be a lot of stresses with these transformers um, trying to dislodge themselves from the mounting. So you want to make sure you put it onto something solid that's not going to let it go flying if for some reason you dropped it for a, for a few inches when you're moving it around on the bench or something like that. Um, the next one up from this that I've got, so this is a small one. It's probably going to, I uh, can't remember the ratings on this one because it's not actually written on it. It's from Amvico Magnetics. Um, I believe that it's a plus and minus nine volt output at about one amp. So you could choose with this one to build a um, you know, nine volt power supply at two amps or an 18 volt power supply at uh, you know, your one amp rating. Now, I know a lot of you might be immediately thinking, well, that's nine volts RMS. That's probably gonna give you near uh, you know, sort of 13, 14 volts um, peak once you've rectified and smoothed it. But you've got to remember, you, there are losses in the system. Every single diode that you put in there is going to drop 700 millivolts. So you've got two in the bridge rectifier alone. Uh, then you've got your drops against your output stages. You know, so maybe you've got another volt or two there. You need a little bit of overhead for your control circuitry so that you can drive these things to the max. So there's another volt or two. And then you've got coarse cable losses going out to your actual project. So what I find as a general rule of thumb, and it's not an exact science, it's just a rough guide to the way I do it, is that if the, you know, if the AC voltage of these things is nine volts, then I just assume that what I'm gonna to have to play with coming out is gonna be nine volts as well. So that's why I'm saying that for this one, um, you know, you can either have nine volts at two amps or you can have 18 volts at one amp. And it's just really your choice. In fact, if you're building a power supply and you have access to some um, switches, you can actually um, put a switch in the circuit for this so that you can actually choose whether you have your nine volts or your 18 volts. Because the way it works with these is you put, if you want 18 volts, you put the center of two of them together and you tap off the other two. So the, the two coils for the output are effectively in series and therefore you get your 18 volts. But if you end up wanting to have nine volts, then you put the windings of each one in parallel and you get your nine volts, but twice the current. Now, you can quite easily have a switch to uh, flip on the front panel or do it in software if you're going to do a microcontroller version with um, some solid state relays or some um, MOSFETs or something like that that would allow you to either parallel the outputs or put them in series. So it's up to you how you end up ultimately doing it, but that's you know, one of the options you can have. The other thing that you have with these is on the main side of these things, they mostly come with two coils. They're both 110 volts, 120 volt coils, and you can choose to put them in parallel um, if you want to run on 110, or you can put them in series to run on 220 volts. So depending on where you're buying these from will depend on how you wire them up. You just want to make sure that you do do it correctly for your region and for your power supply. So just be warned, pay attention to the wiring of your transformers, all right? Anyway, this is a small one. This is like, as I said, about plus or minus nine volts and um, it's got about one amp rating. So going up in sizes, I've got a few here that I've, um, been, that I've got to show you. So uh, Element 14 has been very kind in providing me a whole bunch of different transformers. 
so that I can do these videos and tutorials for everybody. So I have a few to show. So this next one is um, plus or minus 12, it's, sorry, it's got two 12 volt 1.25 amp outputs. So this is, as you can see, it's a physically a little bit bigger than the previous one. Here's the one I had before, which was nine volts. So this is maybe a bit less than one amp. Um, this one is the plus or minus 12 at just over an amp per winding. So, you know, uh, with it, again, you, you know, wire it in parallel, you can get uh, 2.5 amps wired in series. You've got 1.25, but you've got 24 volt output. So now you've got a significant improvement. Now, of course, the price you pay is that it's a bit heavier. So, you, you know, you've got to be more sure of your mounting and it's a little bit more expensive. Now, toroids are more expensive in general anyway, but they do give you a much cleaner um, signal and there's, a, there's almost no stray magnetic um, interference to other things because the nature of the toroid, it keeps all of the magnetic um, fluxes for the transformer contained within the toroid. It's actually a continuous single piece of um, magnetic material inside here as opposed to the square kind of transformers where it's like an E-shape and a separate piece sort of put on the top or something like that um, where there's a lot more gaps. There is no air gap or anything in this that would allow you to start having any stray magnetics. Uh, there's a lot more science to that and you know I'm not going to go into it right here but the one thing I do know is that if you look at any uh, high-end quality power amplifiers and things like that in the audio world or any high-end power supplies uh, they will invariably be using a toroidal transformer. One, to keep the size down, because these are also more efficient. And secondly, to give you a much cleaner um, quality uh, signal coming out of it. So just bear that in mind. If your budget doesn't stretch to a toroid, because they are you know, maybe uh, 30, 40% or even more expensive than a regular square kind of transformer, then that's fine. The other ones will work for most applications perfectly well. Uh, I just happen to be fortunate that I've had some toroidal sent to me from Element 14 to be able to use for this project. So I'm just going to show you, you know, the, the variation. So you've got the really small one. If you want to just build a small power supply, you've got another one, this one. Uh, the rating of this one, it's probably about 30 VA, being 24 volts at 1.25 amps. So it'll be in that order. This one, obviously less. Um, so this one's good for you know most small projects that you're doing. Um, the next one up from that, and if I compare it to the small one again, is this one here. Now, this is the kind of size that I'm ultimately going to use for our project. And this one is actually uh, two 15 volt windings at four amp seat. So I can actually choose to run this with uh, 15 volts at eight amps or 30 volts at four amps. That's now getting you into quite a decent um, rated power supply. So this, this transformer is capable of 120 VA. Um, so that will give you uh, a lot of options for the power supply. And if you don't want to have 30 volts, um, one of these can drive, because the outputs are actually two separate channels, you can drive two channels of a power supply and have them completely independent because there are no internal connections on these transformers. So you can use the two output windings completely independent of each other and uh, you wouldn't have to worry about ground loops or anything like that. So that's another choice rather than buying two individual transformers, one for each channel. And then, um, so yeah, so if, you know, that's the smallest one. Oop, get it better fit there. And if I bring up the other one that we just had, um, this is the 12 volt. Yeah, that's the 12 volt transformer. You can see there how they're rapidly getting bigger and bigger. And then I have one more because I had some issues getting some transformers. And this one is the biggest one of all of them. And this one is actually rated at 160 VA. And it's uh, plus or minus 15 at 5.33 amps. So you can do a 15 volt, 10 amp, you know, almost 11 amp power supply or a 30 volts at 5 amps. So that gives you the next option up. Now, these things are getting pretty heavy. So when you start mounting these, you, you're looking at having to mount them on some kind of steel chassis or something like that. Um, you know, just trying to put this on a PCB, it's not going to cut it. Even the smallest one that I showed you probably wouldn't mount on an actual uh, circuit board very well unless you had uh, a thicker one or some kind of additional reinforcement for it. And if you drop that power supply with one of these mounted on a circuit board, it's probably just going to rip the circuit board right off the mountings if you're not careful. So just be aware of the mounting and just be aware of 
the weight of these things. Um, but at the end of the day, the one you choose is the one that you will need to get to satisfy both your voltage output and your current output. So as you can see now, there are a lot of choices, and this is just a tiny sample of what's available on the market. Um, these are the ones I've just shown you are all available from Element 14, um, or if you're in North America, Newark, and sorry, Newark is the distributor, Element 14 is the community. All right, so that's all of the transformer basic selection choices out of the way. Uh, as I said, it's all about what you want to be able to build um, determines how big a transformer, what kind of transformer you're going to end up getting. So what I've done for the purposes of this video is I've built up a board here uh, with all the relevant pieces. So you've got your mains input at the bottom. Um, now you can see, we're going to do a close up in a moment, but I've secured this and I've kept it as safe as possible. Uh, we're coming into our transformer and I've used the plus and minus 12 volts at 1.25 amp one here. And I've got them wired currently in series so that that's 24 volts and uh, 1.2 amp amps that would be available on the output, you know, allowing for losses and everything else. Uh, I then got a bridge rectifier, which will convert the AC into DC. That then feeds up to some capacitors and then to my, uh, right now it's wired to a connector block. I've got my MOSFET end channel output hooked up, but I don't have a control system in here right now. So it's just uh, on the board for a little bit later. And I've also got a, one of my current sense resistors, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video as well, uh, so that we can actually measure the output current that's coming through this. So let's just uh, readjust the camera and we'll have a closer look. All right, now just as a word of warning, this does have mains on it. I've done the best I can to make sure I can't accidentally touch any mains. So uh, things are taped over, for instance, here, which is where the mains comes in uh, and everything else. But uh, let's just go through what I have here. So this is a uh, mains cable that I actually um, basically recovered from an old uh, printer that I had ripped apart. And the nice thing about it is at this end of it, it has a very nice, uh, huge, solid lump of plastic that I've actually that had two holes already right through it. So I've been able to screw this securely down to my um, piece of wood here so that even, you know, no matter what, it's not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to be stressing at these uh, connections that are uh, put into this terminal block or anything like that. So it makes it a lot, lot safer. Um, alternatives to this, of course, is um, proper cable clamps and things like that if you're wiring up your own mains cable and things. But uh, you just need to make sure that no matter what you do, you've got decent strain relief. This just I just happened to be fortunate that I had this one that came right from a uh, recycled piece of electronics that I was ripping apart. The other word of warning I want to mention right now is that this is, um, you know, my, I'm working on wood here. I'm, I know what I'm doing. And uh, my project does not have a ground connected. Um, it is only 120 volts AC, but it can still kill you if you're not careful. Um, the plug on the end of my cable, as you can see here, has only got the two prongs. Now this is uh, the kind of plug that you use in North America, or in Canada, or in the USA. Uh, obviously in the UK, the plug you have is very, very different and you would have a ground connection. And the circuit that I'm showing you here uh, and the layout, there really is nowhere to easily put a ground except for uh, maybe on the zero volt output of the transform of the power supply. If you've been watching some of the previous videos or doing some learning of your own uh, and looking at power supplies that are commercially available, a lot of these power supplies, the outputs are not tied to ground. And if you think about it, uh, that's a good thing in a lot of ways because if you're using things like oscilloscopes and other instrumentation to hook up to your system, um, you will have to be very, very careful where you hook up the, uh, the, the ground points of your oscilloscope when you're, you know, for, for measuring signals because if your power supply is grounded on its output and you connect the ground pin of the oscilloscope to some other pin you're effectively or other point on your circuit you can effectively short out through the mains ground system your power supply or other part of your electronics and you know not only could you destroy your project but you could also destroy your oscilloscope or any other piece of equipment um, that's connected but what they do do is have um, effectively protection circuits using either MOVs and capacitors and things like that to prevent um, any mains interference getting, uh, you know, causing your uh, output to drift too high above the mains potentials, but while keeping it isolated. I'm not going to go into that 
right now, uh, on, certainly not on this video, uh, but you can certainly look at uh, circuits and things like that and some theory of operation uh, on online. And uh, if I can find some, I'll link in a few articles as well. Uh, I haven't looked for them yet. Uh, but for our project, you know, we're not using a ground. We've just got the mains coming in and um, just laid out and se everything secured on this board to keep it safe. Okay, so the first thing we've got, let's just start at the mains end, which is down on the bottom left-hand corner of this board. We're coming in with our two wires, which is our live and neutral, um, coming into mains input and feeding into the transformer. Now, because I'm in a, uh, a region that uses 110 volts, 120 volts AC, I have the input to the transformer um, hooked up in parallel for the two windings. All right? The alternative, if you were in uh, UK or something, is that you would have the two of the windings, like the brown and the white, connected together and just left isolated uh, but connected. You wouldn't connect your mains input to it, and you'd use your orange and your black wire, for instance, um, to put your 220 volts in so that you have the two windings effectively in series. So for my case here, um, they're in parallel because I'm a 120 volt supply. Uh, on the output of the transform, which is on the other side, and, and notice one of the things I've done here is I've tried to route um, everything else after I've come in on the mains off to the other side of the board and keep it away from this bit here. Um, the heat sink of my uh, MOSFET is a bit close, but there's nothing here that's exposed mains-wise. And even the terminal blocks on the main side, I've covered them over with tape just so that no nothing can drop there and short anything out or I can't accidentally uh, put my fingers in there. And you know these connector blocks, you can't put your fingers directly to the screws when they're screwed down anyway, but it just adds a little bit of extra um, precaution in case I just, you know, without thinking, go and do something silly. Uh, I've also written on here, just a little bit of a reminder to myself and anybody else that's watching, is that this is 120 volts AC, it is mains, and it is dangerous. So just be aware of that. All right, so secondary side of the transformer. They call it the secondary because the primary is where you have your input, and the secondary is where your output comes, and it's typically reduced in voltage. Um, and this particular transformer, I've got 15015 here because I did have another one wired up. Right now, this is 12012. Uh, but as you'll see in a moment, it actually uh, may not appear that initially. So you've got 12, two 12 volt tappings. And as you can see here, there I have the center, I have two of the connections off of the transformer connected together, and the outer two are going to my bridge rectifier. Now, what I, the way that this is wired right now is I've put the two transformer windings in series. So the yellow and the gray wire are one winding, and the blue and the red are the other winding. And you need to refer to the, um, usually the instructions that come with the transformer to make sure you get them wired the right way around. Because if you think about it, while this one is tra traversing to a positive direction from the AC, and the other transformer, depending on how you wire it, could be going to a negative. So if you put those two in parallel, uh, you could do some damage to your transformer, for one, because you're going to be back feeding it. So when you look at the actual leaflet for your transformer, this is the one for these. Uh, actually, this is one for the bigger ones, but they're exactly, you know, the one thing about Hammond with their transformers is they stick to the same color code throughout the transformer, um, all the different sizes and ranges. And um, so, and they stick to the same the method of wiring. So here is, um, you know, the, basically this is, this is one of the things you really need to look at. So on the primary side, it's showing you how to wire your 117 volt, which is anything between 110, 120 volts, so you know, North American voltages, where you're putting them in parallel. So you can see here your AC in, one end comes to the black and the brown, and the AC other end goes to the white and the orange. And then if you're in the 220 volts, 240 volts, like in UK, then you connect the white and the brown together and you put your AC to the black and the orange. All right? So that's the AC side of it. Now on the DC side of it, sorry, the secondary side, if you want to have your outputs in parallel, then the red and the gray go together and the blue and the yellow go together. And you can see here, they have a dot. And what this dot indicates is that given this, the phase coming in, say so the black is going up, then the red is going to be going up at the same time. So they're in phase with each other, and the same as the brown and the gray. Right? So you've got these two, in, these are in parallel, but on the output side, I need to make sure that I get the one with the dot on it 
connected together so that they're in phase with each other and then the ones without the dot connected. So in my case, what I've done is I've connected the blue and the gray together and I'm tapping off the higher voltage output, which is the, you know, 10, 24 volts on the red and the yellow. And as you can see here, the blue and the gray are connected together and the red and the yellow are the ones that are going to the bridge rectifier. All right, the bridge rectifier I've got here, we have a number of ones available. In fact, let me just grab them and I'll show you. So if you are um, building a low power power supply and uh, it's not too high a voltage, then you can get away with um, smaller rectifiers and things. So this is, uh, I've got three different kinds in here, all right? The smallest one here, this is a little um, bridge rectifier and basically there's the four diodes in this little package and you've got AC in and uh, basically your DC out. Not smooth of course, but you've got your DC out. And that will handle 220 volts or 110 volts but it won't handle a huge amount of current, maybe one amp, and that's about it. Uh, if you want to handle more current, then you need to get a bigger bridge rectifier. So this is the next size, and this one, again, is available from Farnells. Um, and this one will handle just a couple of amps, or you know, a few amps. And again, it's um, you know, AC on the center ones, your DC comes out of the outside two connections. Um, it's you know, a little bit bigger, and, it'll ha you know, and as such, it'll handle more. It's completely encapsulated again, so you can't get to the innards or the diodes. If you blow one of the diodes inside these, you can't fix them. You just have to replace them. And then the last one I've got here, which is a much higher capacity one, is uh, this one. And you can see there it's got actually a hole in it. And one of the reasons for that is so that you can actually bolt it to a heat sink. And it's important thing, a lot of people don't realize that you know, they just think, oh, I'm just rectifying it. It's a diode. It doesn't have much power and things like that. But if you consider that, um, you know, in my case, if I use the big transformer in, um, you know, it, that's five amps that can come through that at, uh, you know, plus or minus 15 volts. Um, or if I'm putting that in parallel, then I've got 15 volts, but I've got now 10 amps. Um, a single diode drops about 700 millivolts. So 10 amps at 700 millivolts, that's still seven watts of power dissipation. That's gonna generate a lot of heat. And your rectifier, if you don't have it adequately um, cooled, like with a heat sink or something, it's basically gonna well, break. And if you're lucky, it'll just stop working. If you're unlucky, uh, it may short out and put AC straight to your circuit, or it might blow itself to pieces and cause a lot of um, internal mess and damage to your power supply. Um, so you don't you don't want to have that happen. So it's very important that you pick an adequately sized rectifier for the power supply ratings that you're building, and that you have it adequately heat sink. Now, in this environment here, I'm not going to be loading um, a huge amount of power on this. This is just so that I can go through this tutorial with you guys and show you the indivi the, uh, the in each individual piece. So. I've got my AC coming out of here, which is our plus and minus 12 volts AC. It's feeding into this rectifier. And then on the top pin, and these are always marked with the uh, connection, so you don't have to guess what it is. They're actually, they're in, quite often, in this case, they are uh, molded into the uh, plastic. No, they're not molded, actually, it's just etched onto it. But the inner two, the AC, and it's marked with a little, you know, AC waveform -y signal, and the, um, other two have a plus and minus sign on them so that you can actually make sure you get your connection right. Let me just zoom in and see if I can show you that. Yeah, you can just see that now on the, up there. So you've got your plus one up here, you've got your AC, AC, and you've got your minus, all right? So just make sure you wire them up correctly. All right, so where next? So. We've got our plus coming out of the rectifier and we're now feeding this one. And then you notice that I've used some very uh, thick 12 gauge wire here that uh, for the purpose of this, because um, you know, my transformer outputs is not too heavy a gauge wire and nor is um, the short length of wire going from this terminal block to the bridge rectifier. But I wanted to, uh, as soon as possible, increase it to a decent thickness so that I minimize the uh, losses in the cable. And this is one of the things that you also need to pay attention to. Um, the voltage drop per unit length of cable for say a 20, you know, 18 or 20 gauge wire 
is significantly more than something for say a 12 gauge piece of wire and you know I've done some um, some of my previous videos when we've been talking about the power supply I've shown you when you're measuring current how significant that can be in fact you know a short length of wire like from here to here if it's a thin piece of wire like this can actually have more voltage drop across it than even your current sense resistor has so you just need to make sure that if you want to get the maximum output with the minimum amount of um, losses in the system and you don't want your wiring heating up make sure you use adequate sized wiring for the power the ratings that you're doing and there is um, plenty of tables online that will tell you the AWG um, against the current rating what we have uh, coming out of the bridge rectifier what I've connected up here are two capacitors these are both 10,000 microfarad um, they're rated at 63 volts DC and um, I've got two of them in parallel so what I effectively have here is 20,000 microfarads um, you want to have a decent amount of um, smoothing uh, for high, especially for higher powered um, situations like a power supply because uh, you want to be able to handle transients so if there's little spikes that um, would not you know which could be over the rating of your transformer and your general system if your capacitors are of a decent size then you're not going to dip your voltage down and cause any issues and secondly uh, these these are for smoothing what they're effectively doing is just getting rid of the AC content of your um, load uh, then finally on the output of the capacitors we're coming down to a connector block and what I've done here is that the positive output is running around to my MOSFET and then the black wire here goes through my current sense resistor and out to this end terminal block. Now I put a 10k resistor here. Uh, it's yeah, not that it's going to be dissipating any power or anything like that. But what it will do is gently bleed away any voltages left on these capacitors. You know, 20,000 microfarad at 63 volts, or even you know we've got 24 volts AC here, or maybe a little bit more when it's not under load. Uh, that can pop quite a wallop if you. Um, accidentally short it out with a probe or something like that or you know it's just you don't want to leave them sitting there with a lot of volts on you know if you go near it with a test meter uh, it can take a while to, dissip uh, to uh, dissipate any voltage and therefore the capacity and a capacitor even if your power supply is only rated say at one amp or something like that these things have such a low internal resistance if you've got um, you know, close to 38, 40 volts sitting uh, across these capacitors and you short it out, these have less than one ohm input impedance, uh, sorry, one ohm equivalent series resistance. So you're going to be able to dissipate that 40 volts into, you know, less than one ohm with a short. And so you're going to be putting in, you know, probably in excess of 50 or even 100 amps for a very, very short period of time, but nevertheless, uh, you could deliver that kind of magnitude of power uh, into whatever is shorting that out. Now, if it's a screwdriver or something like that, it's probably just going to blast a chunk out of it. But if that's something else, it could either blow up, start a fire, or um, severe, severely damage whatever you've connected it to if you're not careful. So it always pays to have something that will gently bleed it away. Now, I don't have any um, resistors available to me right now. I just uh, I haven't got any to put on here. But what is typical for a lot of circuits is to put a um, what they call a bleed resistor across the capacitor so that when you turn this off, it will actually start dissipating the, uh, the volts that is in the capacitor over maybe a minute or two. And um, that's what you would normally do in a final installation. I haven't got one on here right now, um, but you know, I would definitely recommend something like that. The thing to watch, though, is that you have it sufficiently high uh, in its resistance that it doesn't start getting hot because obviously you know if you've got 40 volts across here you can't put a 10 ohm resistor across there because that's going to be basically drawing 4 amps and dissipating 40 watts before you even start using anything but also that resistor is going to get very very hot so you might want to just put say a you know even a 1k um, resistor or even higher across these so that it dissipates it uh, but no, whatever you put in do a calculation for the power dissipation because if you just put a little uh, quarter watt resistor like this one and I know because I tried it you put a 1k quarter watt resistor on there it is going to get very very hot very quickly and it won't survive very long all right anyway that's basically the tour through this thing so the next thing is to power it up and start showing you some of the waveforms 
um, just to give you a basic understanding of how this is working. Just before we move on, I just wanted to quickly show you the um, specifications for the two bridge rectifiers that I've got here. Um, this is the uh, smaller of the two, which is uh, this one here. All right, and it's type. It's a vi made by Vichy, and it's a 2KB P01. So <clears throat> this is the data sheet for all of the 2KB series. And the one we have here is the, the 01. So here, and it's rated at 100 volts um, peak reverse voltage. Now that's peak, not RMS, remember. And it's rated at 2 amps. And um, so the maximum RMS voltage here for the BP01 is 70 volts. So we're only using about um, 15 volts plus, so 30 volts RMS. Um, so we're nowhere near its maximum rating, so that's good for anything we're doing. But it's only good to up to about 2 amps. And remember, um, it's, it actually tells you here as well, it's uh, maximum average forward uh, rectified current, 2 amps. Forward volt at 3.1 amps is 1.1 volts. So it's probably going to be a little bit less than that when you're running up to 2 amps through it. But if you just say, assume it's 1 volt that it's dropping across it, then 2 amps, that means that's going to be 2 watts um, drop per diode in that um, circuit. So that's going to be 4 watts getting dissipated. So that's, there's no way of mounting this on a heat sink. But 4 watts, it's going to get warm when you're running it at maximum current. So if you actually want to run it anywhere near its maximum ratings, I would suggest that you actually get a bigger one. All right, and we'll have a quick look at the specs for the bigger one that I have. So this is the specifications for the uh, larger bridge rectifier that I showed you. So let me just grab it again. That's this one. You can see it in context with the size of my hand, much bigger, and it's got a hole through for mounting on a heatsink or something. All right, and the specifications for this one, as you can see, it's actually rated for a forward current of 25 amps, um, up to 600 volts. Um, and it has a forward voltage drop of 0.76 volts, so a little bit less than the smaller one. Um, it's, a, you know, it's an inline bridge rectifier. It shows you the circuit here, and it's very typical. The pinouts are almost identical for pretty much every one I've ever seen, where the outside two are the DC and the inner two are the AC. And if I just scroll down here a little bit, we go to here, um, just to look at the main specification. So again, 600 volts is the RMS, sorry, peak voltage. Um, maximum current 25 amps. That's at 105 degrees centigrade. Uh, typically, you know, 550 amps peak just for a very, very short period of time. You'd never want to work it near that level, of course. But it's forward drop when you're doing um, at the higher current ranges is going to be in the order of 760 millivolts. So let's just say um, that you're running this at 10 amps, then that is 7.6 watts per diode that you're dissipating. And you know, uh, in any one cycle, you're always involving two diodes. So that's 20 watts that's going to be dissipated just in this rectifier when you're running it at its maximum load. So that is a significant amount of heat, and you absolutely would have to have it on a fairly large heat sink to be able to handle that. So just pay that in mind. You know, I'm using the big one on the board here. That way, even, even with an amp with no heat sink, it's going to easily be able to handle that. But if I started cranking this thing up with a bigger transformer towards even just 10 amps, even though it's able to handle 25, it will be getting very, very warm indeed, um, probably to the point where I wouldn't be able to touch it. So anyway, that's the um, extra info on the diodes I just wanted to share with you. So let's just go on to uh, looking at this thing in actual operation. Just before Christmas, Element 14 and Tektronix uh, got together and actually provided me a re very nice Christmas present in the form of a um, MDO 3000 oscilloscope. So I'm going to be using that today to look at all of the uh, waveforms. So here we have it. It's 500 megahertz. Uh, it's got four channel inputs and things. But just before we start, the one thing I'm not about to do with it right now is hook it onto the main side of um, this board that we're looking at. So please don't bother trying to ask me because it's not going to happen. All right. Anyway, um, we're going to use this for displaying the waveforms um, on the power supply in the various stages so you can see what's happening. And uh, so let's start off by hooking it up to the um, 30 volts AC, which is the output of the transformer. So in this case, this is going to be right here. We're going to hook it up across these two connections here. And we'll show you the, your, your basic AC waveform for the mains. All right, and I've got the, the oscilloscope will also allow me to show you the AC 
um, it's got a built-in digital multimeter so we're going to use that as well so I've just turned this thing on so it's currently uh, got mains power on it and again as I said this side it's mains here so everything's covered up there's no chance it's got good strain relief so I'm happy with what that is like now obviously this wouldn't be the way you'd use it in a final product or anything so now let's move up to the oscilloscope so that you can see the waveform that we're going to get out of this this is the 12 not 12 but of course if you look at this it's actually giving me 28 volts not 24 volts and the reason for that is because there is no load on this so the transformer is just going to be you know the um, transformer is basically not having to do any work and typically the voltages will go up a little bit when you don't have a load on here which is exactly what we're seeing but this is basically a reflection of the mains voltage coming in but obviously uh, through the windings of the transformer yeah so this is just the output of the transformer with the two windings in series if I just go to one of the other windings halfway through you'll see that it's pretty much half the size now the one thing that looks a little weird here is it actually looks like part of the AC is a little skewy and that's actually not me doing that that's probably what the mains looks like all right um, but that's fine let me just expand the time base a little bit so you can have a better look at that all right so that's the mains oh sorry that's the low side of the mains but that's pretty much our AC voltage 30 volts um, almost so but it's actually the 12 not 12 so it should be 24 under load now let's start moving forward and we'll start now looking at the output of the bridge rectifier all right now I'm not going to start unsoldering the capacitors and things but I will just go move across so what I'm going to do now I'm just going to point you back at the board so that you can see is I'm going to connect the board to here so the ground of the oscilloscope now remember the oscilloscope is connected to mains ground for its input so you need to be careful that you don't connect things that also have a ground but go to the high side of it where you could actually end up blowing something up all right this is one of the reasons why even if I was even if I had a ground in here I wouldn't have connected to this right now I'd leave it floating so that I can use the oscilloscope now if I go back up to the scope here connected directly across the uh, capacitors that are doing the smoothing and the scope is on exactly the same settings as it was before then you'll see now that it's got 37.71 so that's quite a, um, a high voltage considering the fact that it's supposed to be only 12 not 12 which is 24 volts it's up to 37 but as I said there's no load on this at all so it's uh, sitting at a higher voltage than it would normally be now if I just change the coupling of uh, channel 1 to AC we can actually see if there's any ripple on here um, all right and we so we can now crank up the uh, volts per or down the volts per division uh, let's just go down oh, wrong way 5 10 1 500 millivolts all right now we're at the what we're seeing here basically is um, interference now if I actually take my oscilloscope probe and just literally connect it to the same pin as the um, ground right so let me just show you what I've just done there all right if you look they're both connected to the exact same point here all right there is noise in my lab like you wouldn't believe now this is not just from the oscilloscope or anything else this is a lot of high frequency noise um, things like my LED lights, um, you know, uh, all sorts of things are generating interference. There's wireless networks around and things like that. So there's always a huge amount of noise that your oscilloscope will pick up that you'll think is like, oh, that's a crappy power supply. I got all that noise. I mean, this is like 20 millivolts per division. This is spiking up to way over, uh, probably over 100 millivolts. Well, actually, it's full scale. So two four six eight ten you know 150 millivolts or more of noise there but if I just put a uh, bandwidth filter on the input uh, where's my bandwidth where's my filter oh bandwidth there let's take this down to 20 megahertz you can see that's cleaned it up considerably all right and that's one thing to bear in mind when you're actually measuring um, DC voltages and things especially on a digital oscilloscope it will create a huge amount of or what will appear to be uh, noise from your system but because these digital oscilloscopes have high frequency uh, bandwidth on the inputs it picks up a lot of noise that older traditional lower bandwidth oscilloscopes would never ever have shown you so it um, you know and I've gone through this and Dave Jones of EEV blog and a few other 
um, engineering bloggers have also done the exercise to demonstrate the fact that a lot of this noise has got absolutely nothing to do with the circuit under test and is actually just coming from the environment. Now if I take the bandwidth again and put it back to its full bandwidth, you'll see how the noise now has come back up again on here. Not as bad as when I was hooked onto a circuit, but remember I've got a transformer that's hooked to the mains, all the wiring is going to be picking up uh, all sorts of high frequency interference and everything else as well. So now that I'm actually not connected to anything, it's at an absolute minimum, but it's still picking up noise from other things. All right, if I put that down and let go of it, it really doesn't make any difference. So remember, put your bandwidth down to minimum if you can. All right, and that should eliminate a lot of the background noise. Also, if you think it's your power supply, um, you can literally just turn the power supply off and uh, see what happens. So I'll do that right now and show you. All right, we're connected back to the power supply here. So here's the noise, even if I put it on full bandwidth for the moment. If I actually pull the power from the power supply literally off the main so there's no connection, you can see some of that disappeared. But because there's still these transformers and everything else, it's, it's still picking up a lot of noise and there's still wiring and everything else involved. All right? so it's, but it's definitely not the power supply that's causing this. It's going to be the environmental noise and everything else that's being picked up. So I'm just putting the power supply back on again. Let's reconnect it. All right, so put the bandwidth back to its minimal setting of 20 megahertz. So anyway, the, the thing to remember here, though, is that well, we're right now we're measuring AC. So you can see that the actual normal AC uh, ripple on there is only about 80, you know, uh, one, mil, uh, one millivolt of noise that the scope is measuring. So that's not too bad at all. Now I'm just going to hook up a 10 ohm load to the output of the power supply. It's actually only rated for... Um, 10 watts, so it's going to get about 30 watts through it. It is ceramic, um, so I'm not going to leave it hooked up for very long because, as I said, it's not going to um, survive very well if I do that. I just hook it up long enough to get an indication on the oscilloscope of what's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip it across one of the capacitors here. Okay, so I've just hooked up one side of it now, just with a pair of crocodile clips. And I'm just, I, what I want to show you is what happens with the voltage and everything else. Let me just put the uh, coupling back to AC plus DC and crank this down. All right, so you can see there we've got 20 volts per, let's just go to that setting. We've got uh, 10 volts per division, zero is in the center, so 10, 20, 30, all right, 37 and a half volts. And the DC RMS meter is also reading that. And as you can see there, it's pretty, pretty smooth. So when I connect this um, resistor up, it's going to draw 3 amps out of this thing, which is probably more than it's supposed to handle. And you can see there now that it's actually gone down to... It's starting to get toasty. Um, you can see now that the volts is actually dropped down to 23.6, which is actually not too bad considering that the transformer is only a 1.25 amp and I'm actually drawing... Um, well, it's 10 ohms, so I'm drawing 2.3 amps, so I'm actually drawing twice the current out of it. I won't leave it here for very long because it will do some damage uh, and start heating things up if I do. Uh, but it's you know, sufficient to say that what you can see here now is there is some ripple now on the uh, um, power supply. Now that's because the capacitors, they're doing a grand job of smoothing things, but now that I'm drawing you know, a decent load out of this thing, um, they're not able to get rid of all of it. The volts has dropped back down to where you'd expect it to be, but there is definitely some mains ripple going on. I'm also starting to get some smoke from my resistor, so I'm not going to leave this much longer. If I couple to AC and just crank it up a little bit, you'll see that there's the, um, all right, quite clearly now we have about, oops, my thing is going to die. I've uh, disconnected it now because my Ceramic resistor was starting to go crack on. I just don't want it to actually break itself. So I've uh, <laughs> disconnected it. It's getting rather warm. See, it's uh, still smoking there even though I've disconnected it. Anyway, I need to get myself a much bigger load so that I can do this thing. One of our projects that we're going to do as we go through this is actually to create a DC load with a big heat sink and everything else. That will make this job a lot easier, but we haven't done that yet, so I'm still stuck with using little things like this to actually uh, perform that kind of test with. I think that was sufficient to show you that, you know, under load, the transformer still is able to give out the voltage it's supposed to be, and even 
um, even in excessive load, it was still very, very close to the 24 volts. So if you remember what I said about your, you know, your DC output um, not being anything in excess of what the RMS of the transformer is, this transformer was 12012 AC, uh, which means it gives you 24 volts AC out. And you could see there when we were running that that we were very close to 24 volts DC uh, under a significant load, uh, slightly in excess of what the thing is supposed to handle. Uh, but you can definitely see that you know even at the rating it's going to be very close to that and then with losses and everything else you're certainly not going to be getting any more than what your RMS voltage out of your transformer is rated at. So um, I don't think there's anything else right now on this part of the circuit that I can show you. Um, it's pretty clear how I think these components work without getting into any significant theory of uh, bridge rectifiers and all that kind of stuff all right your transformers the way these work is um, it's because it's running at 60 hertz or 50 hertz in in Europe uh, it's basically on the turns ratio so if you've got 120 volts here and you want to get 12 volts out which is what we have uh, as a 12012 then you've got a basically a 10 to 1 ratio so for every 10 turns on the primary i.e. the main side we're going to have one turn on the secondary side. So that 10 to 1 ratio gives you pretty much exactly what you would get out of this, in which case this is 12 volts. And we have two um, windings on this transformer of 12 volts each, which is why we have the 24 volts coming out. But nevertheless, each winding is going to have one turn for every 10 turns on the main side. And of course, that wiring is going to be a lot thicker than the main side wiring as well, because it's carrying a lot more current um, you know, so for every amp you put on the in, on the input side, you're going to get be be basically drawing 10 amps on the output side because again, it's this 10 to 1 ratio. But in the current side, it's effectively opposite. You do have losses in transformers, even toroidals. They are a lot more efficient than the regular square brick kind of transformers, but they still do have um, losses. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that loss percentage is. But it's certainly nowhere as efficient as a um, switch mode power supply. The other thing to bear in mind with a power supply project like this is that uh, efficiency is not what we're building. Because even if you had a 100% efficient transformer, which obviously they don't exist, but even if you did, um, the fact that you've got, say, 30 volts DC as your main supply for your power supply and you only are putting out, say, 5 volts, to your uh, project at say one amp, that means that you're actually having to get a, get rid of 25 volts at one amp, so 25 watts, which is a significant amount of the um, percentage efficiency. So you know you're nowhere near efficient with a linear regulator power supply uh, in normal use. So it's really not much point in trying to be. Um, you know, I mean, obviously don't go crazy about inefficiencies. You know, you make it where you can. But really, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you're, for most of your projects, you're going to be running in a very inefficient way. You know, it's only when you actually have a final project and you build a dedicated power supply for it where your uh, supply rails are going to be exactly what you need for the project and everything else, and therefore you can minimize your losses. As far as a power supply as a general pur purpose tool that is adjustable between, say, 0 and 30 volts or more, then um, you know it's not going to be efficient no matter how hard you try unless you build it using switch mode power supply technology which is a lot more complicated and it's not part of what we're doing here and of course you get the inherent um, noise and everything else you know we saw that on already on here from external interference but you'd have a lot more if you're doing it yourself without a lot of expensive filtering and um, and uh, you know in the form of chokes and capacitors and things like that Anyway, uh, that's a walk through the input stage. Um, I'm not sure what else I can show you here. Uh, as I said, you can use uh, you know, transformers, big ones, small ones, etc., depending on what your power requirements are. Or you can use, uh, as, as a best example, old laptop power adapters. You probably pick them up at a local charity shop or something else where maybe somebody's uh, laptop has died and they've just thrown it away or put it to a recycle center. And maybe later on they found the power adapter for it and they just dropped it off at a charity shop to be sold for a few dollars. So it would be a very good way of getting um, started with a power supply project. And later on, once you've got your um, skill level up sufficient that you want to be able to try and build your own power stage uh, for the input side of it, like we've just been going through here, then you know by all means come back, rewatch the videos, 
um, and go build one for yourself. But just as a closing thing, again, I can't stress enough that you know on this side down here, this is mains voltage over here and it can kill you if you're not careful with it. So you have to take every precaution you can to protect yourself. And as I said, here I've used um, a pre-existing mains cable which has got a very substantial um, block molded onto the end of it that's allowed me to screw it down to my um, prototype board here that I've been showing to you. And um, again, using connector blocks um, everywhere, it allows me to make easy connections, but also the connections are deep enough that I can't accidentally touch them. Everything on this side I haven't taped over because this is all relatively low volts. It's only like 30 volts and things here. On this side, of course, I put tape over here because it is mains voltage and I don't want to even accidentally risk putting my oscilloscope onto here to see, oh, I'll just have a look at what that looks like and bang, because like I said, my oscilloscope ground is connected to um, mains ground. And in North America, mains ground is not necessarily um, the ground of one of these two pins. I know in a lot of countries, the neutral, you know, you've got your live in neutral and ground. The neutral is actually very, very close to mains ground, and your live swings positive and negative to the neutral line. Um, in North America, your live and neutral swing around um, the ground, so you can't rely on. Um, either one being a true ground. So just be very, very careful what you do. And as I said, if you don't know, then don't. Go the route of uh, an old laptop power supply or something like that. Or even, um, you know, on eBay or something else, there's a lot of pre-built power supplies. Uh, even if you want to, go, you know, even if you're going through the exercise of building all of the control circuitry yourself, this particular bit, which is the focus of this video, is about building the input stage. If you're not comfortable doing this, then don't do it. Just go buy a ready-built power supply that you can wire in, like a, uh, you know, a 30 volt power supply or a 24 volt power supply or something like that for $20, $30 from eBay, or get yourself a, um, an old laptop power brick. Uh, just cut the connector off the end and wire it in. Um, or put whatever connector you want onto it that suits the uh, system you're building and just go with that until you do have the skills and the um, capability of building one that's involving the mains. All right. Anyway, with that, I'm going to close off this video because I didn't want to make this one too long and I'm probably suspecting it already is too long. Uh, so I'm going to just close this one off and move on to the next stage.